So the truth is that this is exactly the mafloket in the Talmud, who is greater at Sadiq, the Chathkila, or the Baal Tshuva. According to the opinion that the Tzaddik is always greater than the Baal Shuvah, that's one opinion, that's not the way the Ramad Paskins decides the Halakha. So, as we said before, the Talmud Yerushalmi is always, would be higher than the Talmud Bavli, because the Talmud Yerushalmi is, is on the ball, on the right road and path from the outset, and doesn't have to be turned around. Its head doesn't have to be turned over. But the Talmud Bavli, which is Bina, often has to have its head turned over. But according to the opinion, which is the opinion that we decide the halakha by, that the Baal Shuvah is greater means that it is his, the light, the insight that he achieves at the end, after the Ephraim is is even a, a deeper, it's called Yitron Ha'or Minachoshus, it's called the advantage of light that comes from darkness. Meaning that it was good that your initial common sense was wrong, just so long as you have sufficient shti, this power of Shtikav quiet and be able to quiet yourself and give up your initial way of thinking and be able to accept a totally new way of thinking about the whole universe. And then it was Kedai, it was worthwhile, it was very, very worthwhile that you had to make that switch much better than had you known, so to speak, the truth from the beginning. But the light of the consciousness that comes from the metamorphs of, tur of turning your mind around, turning your heart and turning your consciousness around, which is called counterintuition, is, is the Baal Tshuva, which is much greater The place that the Baal Tshuva stands, the greatest Sadi cannot stand there. All right, so once more, this is the absolute that shines in the darkness of each one of the respective worlds that we'll now explain. So, so first, so now we'll go back. Special relativity is reorientation. That's the word that we'll use for it. It's total reorientation towards the universe, especially, as we'll explain more in the continuation, it makes, it does two things. First of all, it connects and unites energy and matter by the most famous equation in all of science, which is E equals mc squared. That's special relativity. And not only does it do that, but it makes space and time a part of the event, not just the backdrop upon which the event takes place, meaning that space and time itself is relative concepts that change according to the observer, and the only thing which is constant is the speed of light. It's very interesting that nowadays, in the, the most recent developments in thoughts of science, that we know that the scientists, in order to, to come closer to Einstein's dream of unifying all of the four forces of nature, come up with all kinds of new ideas all the time. One of the ideas is that maybe the speed of, of, of the speed of light itself, C, the speed of light, maybe it, it itself changes with time. Maybe at the beginning of creation, the speed of light was much, much greater than it is now, much faster than it is now. This would also explain millions of things in accordance with the Torah. This is now a theory which is gaining more and more popularity as something that can't be proven as of yet, even though there are attempts to try to indicate it, to find this reflected in nature, that at one time the speed of light might have been greater than it is now. For Einstein, the speed of light, for the special theory of relativity, the speed of light is the one and only constant in the universe. The Rebbe taught us that all of the laws of nature are not necessarily constants. 
And we can't use what's called extrapolation to assume that the laws of nature as we observe them today were always the, the same as they are today. Meaning that the speed of light itself could have been different. The most modern scientists are now saying this. Meaning even or something which is equivalent that the fine structure constant could have been different. That would change reality totally. These are things that that most, most modern research is probing into. Nonetheless, what the special theory of relativity does, it says that, that, that everything depends upon the observer. The only constant in the world is the speed of light. That is counterintuitive in the world of action. The world of action is the world that it appears to you that a person that's on the move is on the move, a person that's at rest is at rest, it appears once more, as we said before, that space and time are backdrops to reality. They don't participate within events that take place, as Newton thought. That's the world of Asya. Special theory of relativity is counterintuitive to that, to, act, to the normal mindset of the world of action. So once more, what does it boil down to? As we said in the beginning, it boils down to the person can be running, running, and running his whole life. And at the end, he, 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 he went no place. He went no place. Who, who's the only person that really is going someplace? The person that's attached to light. If you're on the beam, if you're on the beam of light, then you're really moving. Light is the Torah. If you are not on that beam of light, so you're, you're stagnant, you're not going anyplace. You can be running and running as fast as you want, but you're really not going anyplace. That's what it boils down to. That's the absolute counterintuition of the world of Asiya. What about the world of Yetzirah? General relativity posits First of all, it takes into, into consideration gravity, which was not considered in special relativity. Gravity is one of the four forces of nature that we'll go on to explain in Ritz Hashem in the continuation. It's the most elusive of all the forces. But uh, the realization that Einstein came to 10 years after his, his first theory of special relativity was that once more from the, from ex the experience of the observer, this is called the equivalence principle. That from my experience, to experience a pull of gravity and to experience acceleration are equivalent to one another, the same as one another. And this has far, far-reaching consequences. Once more, general relativity is based upon the equivalence principle. That this was a tremendous eureka insight of Einstein. The, the example that's brought is a person is going up an elevator, you're in, you're in an elevator. And the elevator is not just going up at, an, at, a, at a fixed uh, speed, it's accelerating. If the elevator is going up in acceleration, so you feel a very strong pull down, your, your legs are pulled down to the floor of the elevator. That pull down that you feel when you're going up in an accelerating elevator is identical to what you would feel in a gravitational field. The insight that experiencing acceleration is identical to experiencing gravity this is the equivalence principle, which is the basis of general relativity. It sounds pretty simple, but it, as we said, it has far, far-reaching consequences. And the farthest reaching consequence, or the, the, the essence of the theory as it's written here on the board, is that what comes out of this is that space is not flat. So